Hello and welcome to the Fitness for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And if you are watching our video format today, you'll recognize that I am definitely not in my recording spot. My husband and I are on an anniversary trip to Scotland for our 19th anniversary, and I am popping in here to record a little promo for the people that will be on today's podcast, Brent and Katie from Yeah Baby Goods are with us today to do an interview about how they integrate their family into their family business and the lessons they've learned along the way in prioritizing family over money or over success by the way the world views it. So I think you're going to be really blessed by this conversation, but first I want to tell you a little bit about their company. So the $20 Antelope Ikea high chair is the best selling high chair in the world because it's just so basic and so affordable and Katie loved it and it worked well for her four kiddos, but she wanted to take it up a notch. So yeah, baby goods began as a way of adding accessories like silicone food mats and stylish cushions and leg wraps. And then it's evolved into more things like food grade silicone, um, dishware for kids, which we are huge fans of. When my twin bees open the drawer, they throw all the other dishware out and say this one. Um, and they also have their best-selling restaurant kit, which consists of a cute little bag with a zip and some food scissors and a silicone mat that you can take to a restaurant with you, cut up the food for your little one and have a safe and clean environment for them to eat on, you know, as safe and clean as toddlers will allow it to be. Um, that makes a great baby shower gift or a mama gift for a friend in your life. And you can use my code M is for mama, M I S F O R M A M A. I'll put it in the show notes at yabbybegoods.com for 20% off your order. All right, friends, today I have with me Brent and Katie from Yeah Baby Goods, and they are here not to just promote their product, which I've already told you that we enjoy in our house and think you should totally check out, but to talk about bucking an American trend and culture that says that we should be very compartmentalized as a family, that everyone should pursue his or her own individual interests rather than, I love the word you use, Brent, integrating as a family whole and working together. So welcome Katie and Brent to the show. Thank you for having us. This is very exciting. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. Um, And Brent, I loved the ideas that you were pitching to me about what it looks like to work together as a family unit. So maybe just introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about yourselves, kind of your family journey, and then we'll jump off from there. Yeah, sure. So um, we have been married for 17 years and we have four kids. Their ages are 10, eight, six, and three. And um, when we first got married, we were kind of pursuing the corporate paths. I was in uh, accounting and Katie was in marketing. And we kind of just had visions of doing the normal American family um, and climbing the corporate ladder. And um, through a series of events, we kind of, um, all of that got challenged and we we figured um, that there was kind of a better way. So uh, we've started, I guess now we've actually started four businesses. Two of them are no longer um, active, <laughs> um, but um, now we have, a Katie and I run Yeah Baby Goods together. We have a couple of rental properties that we do. Um, and so those are our main two businesses and, um, we love integration. We love doing, um, we love having our kids participate in our work. Um, and so that's really, uh, what we're passionate about is not just working to earn money, but working to allow it to, uh, give us opportunity to be with our kids and train them and, um, and really disciple them through our work. So is there anything you'd add to that? think that a lot of people start small businesses because they have dreams of more independence or a different version of success and flexibility, or maybe they just have an idea they're super passionate about. We actually set out to um, start our own business in order to have this level of integration. So it started with a vision first, which was that our team could function, like our family could function as a team, all working towards something together. And we do that in business. And then we also do it throughout the day in our everyday home life, including homeschool and other aspects of of how we run the household. So it kind of was started as this vision and we're watching it trickle down in each of our areas. Like you said, Abby, usually those people, um, people keep those different areas segmented and we're trying to incorporate Mm -hmm. family in all of them. 
Which I think it's so interesting that we have to be so intentional and work so hard at this in today's culture, considering that this would have been the norm um, throughout history that families would have lived, worked, eaten, played, rested together. I'm yeah. always bringing up Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8 and this idea of teaching God's ways to our children when we lie sick, walk and stand, yeah. which implies that we're doing a whole lot of life together. Um, I also think, and I'll, I'll mention more about this as it comes, as it maybe comes organically into the conversation, but I also think as someone who um, has also done rental properties with my husband, has built houses together with him and has multiple businesses that we run together that allowing our kids to see the kind of collaboration and teamwork and um, kind of compassion and also compromise in a good way that happens between not only a mom and a dad, a wife and a husband, two business partners that are kind of pulling together in the same Mm -hmm. direction is such a good model for them. It's good for them to see us having to work through conflict and to strain toward collaboration. Um, So I I would love to hear about some of the aspects of your journey that did lead you this. You said kind of through a series of events. Can you elaborate on that? Kind of what what shifted your mindset? Yeah. Um, Well, so I think what what started is Katie and I, before kids, had a um, two-year like work program overseas in the Cayman Islands. So I was um, auditing hedge funds in the Cayman Islands and, you know, my, my ideal of kind of climbing the corporate ladder, becoming partner and kind of, uh, you know, living for maximizing our wealth was really challenged there because we saw a lot of extreme wealth, wealth in the Cayman Islands. And um, it kind of turned our heart away from that and thought maybe there's something better to live for. And then meanwhile, we were kind of um, starting to, uh, you know, we, we wanted to start a family at that point. Um, and we got plugged into um, a, uh, we, we connected with a mentor um, named Jeremy Pryor. He's written a book called Revision. Um, that's a really awesome book. Um, and that, we, we read that together and that really um, radically changed how we viewed um, family and work. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result of like reading that and kind of being connected with him, we had like within a couple of years had moved across town to be near family. We had quit jobs and started businesses. We had bought into homeschool. Like it, it changed a lot of things. And, and really the idea there is kind of what you guys have been talking about where first of all, like uh, we just had this, we, we realized that like this idea that, that kids are a drain on our resources and kids are a liability. They, they exhaust us, they cost us money, like that, that doesn't have to be the narrative and that like kids are actually mm-hmm. an asset. Um, and Absolutely. that, yeah, that, that, that kids are, um, they make us stronger and we like our kids and we want to be around our kids and we want to do things together yeah. with our kids. And so, um, that was really appealing to us. And so I think that was the biggest, um, factor. So Katie, were you guys already believers before this shift happened? Yeah, that's what I was going to say is actually we both grew up in wonderful Christian homes and it was kind of just one of those things where even people who are raised by wonderful Christian parents in that kind of environment, the American culture is so strong that unless you consciously are fighting against it, you just fall into it. And that's just part of the American story is where it's like you graduate high school, you go to college, you get married, you start your corporate job, you have kids and you work for retirement. And that's like the end goal. And it was like, these are all paths that are set before us. And unless we have something that's a fork in the road, that's taking us a different direction, that's just naturally where a lot of people are going to fall. And so it was kind of truly just God's Holy Spirit in us working at just the right time to soften us where it was like, what if there's a different way? What if we can be more intentional at each of these steps, not just doing what is supposed to be the next thing, but being like, God, what do you want us to be doing? And that's really Mm. kind of changed all those individual aspects. I love that. And I'm hearing so many words that I love the idea of open handedness. Like it talks about in James that if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that buy this rental gain or lose wealth have this many number of kids or not like this just idea that is so scriptural and yet so countercultural. and then use the word intentional. And that's a word that I love so much because I feel like we're also told as a culture that especially when it comes to parenting, 
Um, of course you should parent well, but almost as an afterthought, kind of like pursue your, and, and you said that the, the path that's pushed. And I would say that the one step that is becoming more and more kind of optional and or maligned is the having kids step. Because right. as you said, Brent, when the idea is kind of that they detract from your ability to climb that ladder faster or get higher, and we have a culture that's telling us that the greatest good is our own happiness mm-hmm. and our own um, fulfillment, then kind of kids are, they, they don't make a lot of sense if the mm-hmm. goal is you first and comfort first. Um, because you have four kids, you know that there are a lot of uncomfortable scenarios in parenting mm-hmm. and a lot of scenarios where you have to put yourself second, third, last, just like scripture calls us to do. Um, so you have four, you said ages yep. 10 and under, what was your youngest? Three. Three. Okay. So you were in it with all of those young stages, but you said we like our kids and we like to spend time with them. I love hearing that. Tell me, tell me kind of how that came to be and why that's true for you guys. You know, it's truly like, I think not necessarily something that comes really naturally to everybody. And there is some um, upfront work in that too, in training your young kids so that they, when they are age 10, there are people that you genuinely enjoy being around. And I think sure. some of it is when you um, take the path of, you know, you're gone at work most of the day, your kids are at school most of the day, you're not having a lot of touch points to build that connection and that love and that like foundational family memories and things that are like those bonding moments, you're missing out on some of those. And I think by having this really integrated approach where we are doing life on life together and experiencing wins together and experiencing losses together, it does change that relationship and make it go deeper into something where you can actually really enjoy each other. You know each other, you enjoy each other, you're part of each other's lives. And and there is that team mentality where it's like, I'm here for you. I'm with you. I'm supporting you. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what I'm hearing. Sorry, go ahead, Brent. Well, I was just going to say, I think that, um, you know, for us, a a lot of it too, is just kind of realizing that like, our kids are like our legacy, you know, like our kids, our life doesn't just end at when we die, you know, it, like life it continues after that. And so seeing that, like that the most, we could build a couple of businesses, we could make a lot of savings, we could have a great retirement, but like the greatest, like none of that pales in comparison to like leaving a, a, a legacy, an impact through like future generations. Yeah. And we won't take any of it with us. Right. The only thing that we have even a possibility of quote unquote, taking with us, not, not physically, but in the impact that we've left is eternal souls. Mm -hmm. And of course we have these souls under our roof. And Katie, you were talking about the time that we have. If we choose kind of these unconventional routes where we're not sticking to the nine to five or the eight to four for school. And I want to emphasize that again, that word intentionality matters so much because I do know people that have different schedules than the norm, but they're kind of coasting with their kids. There's more time, but there's not really focused connection. And so I want to emphasize for those of my listeners who feel like, um, I, I don't, I don't feel like this is an option. Like I'm a single mom. My husband's pretty locked into this job. We don't have family. Cl- like, I feel like my options are limited. One, if you feel that tug on your heart for things to change, pray for the Lord to provide a way. And pray very specifically for wisdom and how to have the courage and faith to step into those ways, even if they're kind of scary when they first start. And two, we're called to be content in all circumstances. So I love having you guys on here. I love your vision. I love the encouragement that you're giving to our listeners. But at the same time, I know some people are like, I don't think I'm the business owning type. You know, that's not the path for everyone. Maybe I don't feel like I'm the home educating type at this point, or maybe ever, but that intentionality and that being willing to say, just because the world says this is the way it's got to be, does not mean that it needs to look that way in our home. I think that that is key. Um, so tell us a little bit about this particular business that you run called Yeah Baby Goods and how it came to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I will answer that really quick, Abby. I just wanted to say, I love what you were saying because I do think you hear other people's stories and you're like, that's just not like where our family is. And I heard this quote 
and I have it printed on um, in our nursery and it's just steward well the moments you've been given. And I really latch onto that because it's like when you're driving your kid um, like home from school, if you've been sitting in car line and you're taking them home, like steward that time well, like the bedtime yes, routine yes. and like reading to them, the time that you have around the table, all those moments that just feel like just routine, like pour meaning into those. And I think that- Yeah, they could be throwaway or they could be so full of important training and connecting moments, 100%. Yeah, I think it goes back to that, like there's an overhead mission and vision and your job or your schooling or um, your home life, those are all tools to do that mission. And it can look a lot of different ways for a lot of different families. It absolutely can. But back yeah, to I Yeah Baby that. Goods. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so we started Yeah Baby Goods in um, 2016. So we are ago. on year eight. And it's it's really started with the IKEA high chair, which is a super basic, um, no frills, $20 high chair. Very popular because of its price point, um, mostly. And we had that with our firstborn. And then when our second was ready to start solids, we were like, you know, there's really some things that could improve this high chair. And we just started making accessories that you can add on to this um, basic high chair to make it more comfortable and also more aesthetic and just something that can spark joy in the home. And so um, that was really the vision. And from there, it's grown. We've added um, other feeding accessories and things to help parents on their journey with um, real little ones and toddlers. And it's truly just a joy to run. It works with um, mostly new parents, parents of young kids, people that are in our same life stage. And it's so fun to be able to connect with them and use the platform God's given us to be a light and a source of hope in what can be kind of, like you mentioned, a really trying time with hard moments. And so We um, definitely have a goal to stay in business, to provide for our family and to use the business to teach our kids. But a very important goal right up there is to be able to be a light and help equip young parents who are in a similar life stage as us. I love that goal. Brent, talk to me a little bit about what she just mentioned, which is to involve your kids. What does that look like practically for your business, especially considering your kids are 10 and under? Yeah. Um, so, well, that's, that's, what's awesome about kids is, <clears throat> and this is again, going back to like a shift in our mentality around kids in general is like when, when kids are really young toddlers, you get a screwdriver out and you start working on something and they rush over and they're like, can I help? Like, I want to hold the screwdriver. Yeah. I want to do what you're doing. And like, we actually typically train them to not help, but to train them to like, give me some or in space. The kitchen, you're baking and they're like, right yeah. there. And you're like, yeah. I want to help you. 100%. And they have that natural desire. Right. But like, we kind of train that out of them almost go, go sit in front of the screen. It's more convenient if I can do this by myself. But so yeah. we've just kind of early on just been like, okay, if I'm going to do something like come along, it's going to make it longer and maybe more inefficient, but yeah. like, I'm going to teach you how to do this yeah. and instill in you that love for working that you already have early on. Um, so now that our kids are ages 10, 8, 6, and 3, our three-year-old still is kind of just in the baby model phase. She sits in the high chair. Well, when she was <laughs> two and under, she, you know. But the other, the big three, they'll come with me to work. They'll, um, you know, they can sweep up. They can break down boxes um, and take those to the trash, clean up trash. But they're actually awesome. So our business, Yeah Baby Goods, is e-commerce business. They're awesome at fulfilling orders. So um, we can give them, you know, labels with packing slips and they will take the packing slip. They'll go around the warehouse, collect all the things, give it to me, and then I'll review it and stuff the envelopes and pack it up. And um, I mean, it's just amazing how much like value they add to our family business. So it actually is because when you think about it, we started having them involved in all those tasks because we wanted them to feel like part of the team. And when Yeah Baby Goods has a win, we want them to feel that and feel like, hey, I'm part of that. But honestly, it's shifted from like, let's do this for their benefit to like, they we actually are very yeah. helpful. <laughs> like, and, and so we have, don't take long to get to that point. We have a full-time fulfillment manager who does um, most of our order fulfillment, but like when she's on break, uh, you know, on holiday or when we are have more orders than she can handle, we'll say, hey kids, I know, you know, that you want to help out. You, you help make our team stronger. We're going to, we need you today. And they're like, all right, let's go, let's yeah. do it. And so they come in to work with us and, um, love trying to, you know, or love fulfilling orders and trying to help the family business. They, they really take that. Ownership. And I love that. You're including them 
as a way of giving them ownership and giving them value and giving them a very, um, very directed way of seeing what their contributions produce. But as you pointed out, you've got a management person who could do it a lot faster. And so I think, you know, surely somewhere out there, there's going to be some detractor that's like, oh man, they just want their kids for free labor or whatever. But (laughs) we are paying the fact of the matter is (laughs) we are earning money. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. Um, But, but even if they were free, even if their contribution were, this is something we do as a family, we're all kind of just in it till we can get to the point where we can pay you. I think that the fact that you have pointed out, it would be so much easier Mm. to hire an adult. It would be so much easier to do it ourselves. And yet so much easier often means that we have children that get, and I'm going to tell you that this is probably coming because I love my kids to death and they are super sweet and they have great attitudes about helping. But there is this shift that happens somewhere in the teenage stage where they actually start realizing that volunteering to help for fun isn't as fun because they start feeling more like adults and it starts feeling more like work, right? And one of the things that we've noticed is if you have been really faithful to train up that foundation in this is a significant contribution, work is good because God wants us to have purpose and to do everything that we do for his glory and not just for our own gain. And that being a blessing, which is our family motto to each other, is a way of practicing skills that will help us to be a blessing to the future and a light to the world. If you have set all those foundations in place, even when they go through that transition of realizing, oh, like now I have to work for the rest of my life, not just I'm kind of play working. Yeah. Those good habits will, will still, they'll kick in. Well, right. Yeah. So that's actually the thing. Like we, we both said, we recognize like I could get this job done faster if I did it myself. And you know, when, when I have a kid helping me, like it can be more inefficient at the early stages, but like really what you're doing is you're just like, you're just kicking that can down the road for your kid's sake, you know, in terms of like teaching them work. Um, so that I think I'm going to butcher the quote, but there's a Frederick Douglass quote. That's like, it's easier to train responsible kids than it is to fix or repair broken men. You know, so like we yeah. could, we could, yeah. teach her, you know, we could just say, Hey, I'm going to get this done more quickly, but then I'm going to have a whole big, like, I'm going to have a big problem down the road when my kids are, you know, not wanting to work or they, you know, just want to play video games or just, um, sit in front of screens or something like that all the time. Um, so even though, like, even though it is more work up front, you're saving yourself so much benefit, like so much effort at the end. There's so much benefit that you'll, you'll draw on years from now. A hundred percent. And, and y'all have both talked about liking being around your kids. And I think I have a whole podcast episode where I'm like, if your kids don't feel like a blessing, it, it might be sort of your fault. And nobody wants to hear that. But if we're honest as parents, we can recognize that sometimes when we have taken the easy way out on the front end, that we end up feeling frustrated by our kids' behaviors or attitudes on the back end. And if we take a good hard look at the person that was responsible for investing in those, but we abdicated early on, man, it can be really convicting. The good thing is, as you say, it is very hard to fix a broken man, but while we still have children under our roofs, we have an opportunity to pivot. Um, I, this wasn't a scripted, none of these are really script, scripted questions, but this wasn't something that I, um, you guys asked me to ask you that I was thinking to ask you, but the, the question pops to mind. Is there a time where you felt like something wasn't working and you had to pivot as a family and kind of how did that go? Yeah. I mean, I think that happens a lot, honestly. And, and starting back from when they're very little, like we've tried to do, um, like a family Bible study night, we do it in um, every morning. We read scripture at the breakfast table. That's one of the gifts of having homeschool and work for yourselves is our mornings are a lot less rushed than a lot of families. But additionally, we have like a worship night and a Bible reading night. And when our kids were really little, they're, they're antsy and they're having a hard time sitting still for that. And so you kind of try a bunch of different things and it's trial and error to figure out like, okay, is part of it like we need to do question and answer and they get like, candy rewards like for being listening and being able to answer that or is it putting out dish towels on the rug and you have to stay in your dish towel and it is a lot of like okay let's give this a try and see how this solution works and 
Okay, that one's not the not the fix, and you keep working with it. And I <laughs> love that there's that kind of flexibility as parents that um, you're not set in stone in any tradition that you start or any routine. Like you have that power to continue meddling with it and there's real beauty and creativity in that if you choose to see it like that instead of like this um challenge that can't be like overcome if you're just like okay like that one wasn't it but let's put our heads back together yeah i think i think that's a great example i think another one that popped into my mind is um we use something called a marble system which is basically like a uh, a reward system to incentivize our kids to do um, certain things. So if they help out with something around the house without being asked, we'll give them a marble. Um, it's also a great way that, you know, a way you can discipline them through taking marbles away. Um, so that has had so many iterations, you know, like there's been times where we, we created this marble system and basically the, the, the marbles are a currency. You can trade the marbles in for um, something. So um, you know, figuring out like, uh, okay, all of a sudden they were getting more screen time because they were saving up their marbles and that's all they wanted to use it for. We had all sorts of things on this yep. list for the marble marketplace. And so we had to like, you know, uh, figure out how do we, how do we change this so that it's still, um, a training tool, but it's not going to create more screen time. Um, and so, yeah, I think right. that was the other thing that was like really, and it's so fun because, um, you know, it, it just, it's, it uh, gives you a really um, fun way to just kind of like tinker with something or experiment. Okay. If we change this, how does, how are they going to, um, how's it going to change their behavior or their, um, you know, their, their attitude and, and stuff like that. So yeah, we've definitely had yeah. parenting, a lot of, a lot of pivots. And a yeah. business too. Well, I, mean, I, I think constantly yeah. trying to refigure out things. You do something for a season and it's working and it stops working and that's mm -hmm. parenting, that's business, that's life. And you're back to the drawing board just when you think you figured it out. Yeah. And I think that's by design. The Lord wants us to rely on him. He wants us to be seeking his wisdom. And if we had this perfect life formula that we could apply to everything, that would be man's wisdom and we could boast in our own efficiency and our own ability to kind of produce an end result all the time. We would be pretty self-reliant. We wouldn't be boasting in Christ and the mm -hmm. fact that we need him every hour. I, I love your positive response and outlook on that where it's like, this is fun. This is a challenge. This is an opportunity. That is the opposite of what I normally hear from people who are facing adversity. It's like, this stinks. I hate it. This is miserable. I want it to be fixed and to stay fixed. I want everything that works for this kid to work for this kid because that would make my life easier. And man, I, I can relate. But I think that part of the way that the Lord grows us is to help us to view challenges differently, um, to help them to to help us to view them as an opportunity to change our mindset. I was just working on a chapter for my third book earlier and was talking about that Romans five passage where it says. Um, and we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering, suffering produces character and character produces endurance and endurance produces hope, essentially. And um, man, when we try to bypass some of those snags or needs for pivots or challenges or things that just fail miserably, we don't realize that we might be avoiding the hard thing in the present, but also missing out on an opportunity to experience tr true hope in Christ, which man, w once I think about it that way, it's like, Okay, Lord, scary prayer, but bring it on. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. what do you have for us? Yes. I think that's yeah. so true. I love that. That remembering how important it is to remember that this earth is not like what it's all about and that we're actually living for the eternal. And I think that's something we've tried to really ingrain in us and in our kids is that whenever we experience toil or setbacks or something in this earth that's not as it's supposed to be, it's a reminder to hope for um the eternal life where all of that will be fixed. And it does give a different perspective in hard times too, where you're like, this isn't fun, but there's a reason this isn't fun. It's because we're living in a broken world and it just is another reason to have our hearts say like, Lord, come quickly. Absolutely. Brent, can you give our listeners before we sign off, can you give them some, I know that there are people out there who are like, this is my dream. I want to be at home with my family. Not everybody's feeling that way at all, but some people have felt this tug in their hearts and they just don't know where to start. Do you have any really practical tips for them? 
Um, yeah, so I would say, um, you know, not everybody needs to just go tomorrow, quit their job and try to start a family business or anything <laughs> like that. I think that right. it just takes baby steps of like, maybe dad's choosing to, um, you know, put their phones down more or choosing to play less golf mm. or um, choosing mm-hmm. to leave work a little bit earlier to to be more present at home and build those relationships and connect with their kids more. I think that's like one step of just like maximizing or trying to be around your kids. Or involving um, them in the things you're already yes, doing. Yes, like if and, you're working out, like involve yeah. your kids in that. Or if you're running an errand, yeah. you say, hey, let's go run this errand together. Yep. So I think those are really just practical, 100%. like simple ways that you build that relationship. And the more that you're around them, um, I think that that will create just so much benefit for your relationship. But I also think like it was out of those things. So like I mentioned, we started four businesses, like really a couple of them really existed just because of our kids. First of all, with Yeah Baby Goods, which was a high chair business, like had we not had kids, we never would have had, had um, sure. you know, the opportunity, inspiration, inspiration <laughs> thing, yeah, to start Yeah Baby Goods. Um, another business I started, um, which I'm no longer doing is called Fly Up Fitness. And it was um, something where it was like a home workout um, accessory. And you would use this home workout tool while you you know, in convenience at home. And like, I would involve my kids in those workouts. And in the days back before TikTok and everyone had a viral video, um, we had several videos of me working out with my kids just go really viral. And so it's almost out of me just spending more time, maximizing my time with kids that some of these businesses were birthed. Um, and now that might not be the case for everybody, but, um, but I think, yeah, out of just a desire to really be with our kids and maximize that time together, um, it led to a lot of opportunities. So I'd say, yeah, start there, Um, starting just kind of trying to maximize time with kids in in the little ways and um, and then kind of see where that leads. And you kind of mentioned this, Abby, it's just like asking the Lord, like saying like, this is on my heart and it's so countercultural. It has to be from you, Lord. And if you're giving me this dream in my heart, how are you going to help me? Like, how are we going to do this? And keeping your eyes open for like, opportunities and little words that God's giving you or things that you're noticing like that, Oh, Hey, maybe there's a product missing there, but like really inviting the Holy spirit into that where it's like, I know this is from you, Lord. And so like, how do we, how do we do that? How do we go in that direction and start showing me, start giving me ideas. And it's like, I mean, starting up all of that, even just shifting in your mindset, but let alone starting a business, like all of it is hard and grueling. And like going back to your last point about like, the the challenges of life and it being difficult like those are some of the sweetest times though like going through hard things are some of the times that are um like you look back on those with fondness and you're like wow at the time it seems unpleasant but you look back on you're like wow god taught us so much through that like we see the benefit of it coming out of it and so um yeah it, it can be grueling and hard shifting your mentality um but yeah i think um honestly just having that that the small shift in my kids, you know, Psalm 127, our kids are a blessing. They're not a drain, yeah. they're not a liability. And um, wanting to spend time with them, wanting to be together, I mean, um, I think that is the, the best baby step that you can take. Yeah, I agree. So I'm, I'm going to end on something possibly controversial, not very, but you mentioned that that path that culture sets out before us, Katie. And you mentioned going to college. I know you guys both have your degrees. You've used them, obviously, with business development and marketing and all the things that you've done. If you had to do it over again, do you think you would do college again? And is that something that you envision for your kids? Well, first of all, we met at college. Yes. So this is going to weigh. <laughs> yeah. So let's do college again. That's a good idea. Yes, we met. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like I, uh, Brent mentioned, we both started out in corporate jobs and we were using our degrees very specifically. What we are doing now, I definitely did not need a degree for. Now, my degree was in business, so you could make the argument that I'm using some of those business skills. I really think uh, we are learning as we go far more than me pulling yeah. back what I learned in college. Like It's like you you learn through experience. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, well, um, <clears throat> I think it's really kid specific too. You know, you've got to kind of figure yep. out, like, um, I feel like our best, our biggest goal for our kids, um, and through homeschool is to train their heart. And then the second biggest goal is to kind of identify what they're passionate about. And so if yep. another 
child was like really interested in accounting, which I don't know why you would be <laughs> having done that for years. But <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> it, you, may need, you may need a, a degree in that. But even even just being creative with that, you know, I think that as a homeschool family, I know that there's a lot of like CLEP tests, there's a lot of online degrees that you can do. So um, I know that there are uh, just a lot of different avenues for different families. And I think that it is really, really pretty kid specific. I would say the idea of automatically assuming all four of our kids are going to go to a big university and take out student loans to get a degree. I think, no, we're opposed to that um, default position. You're right. But, um, but yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's pretty kid specific in determining paths. Totally. And I don't want to yeah, I love that because go ahead. intentional like over and over, but like that's just another decision that you shouldn't just default to, but be intentional about and be like, God, God, why would you want me to go to college? Maybe it truly is not even about the career, but it's about being a light at this campus. Like, I mean, there could be many reasons yeah. God wants you to go to college, but it like all things in life, it shouldn't be something that we do just because it's the next step. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing a big shift for a lot of parents, especially homeschooling parents, I would say, but even even more traditional schooling parents saying, like, is this really needed? And then there are the people that kind of swing the pendulum all the way to no one should go to college because it's a total scam and right. there couldn't be any benefit from it. And I love that your response is instead to be like, what is the purpose? What does the Lord have for me? What is this kid's passion and how would that best be accomplished to bring glory to God and provide for our family and, and provide stability for that. Um, potentially if the Lord brings that along, that's just basically where we are. Our first is in a boot camp for software development, mm-hmm. which is what my husband does as his main job. But he went to college, got the four-year degree and was like, I learned nothing about software development during that. I was self-taught afterwards, but I have the piece of paper. And so my firstborn's like, Mm -hmm. okay, maybe I'm not going to go that route. I'm going to do the experiential apprenticeship boot camp thing. And then our second born is interested in something that's probably going to require a degree. So we will kind of get there and see how it goes when he graduates. But because we're a homeschooling family as well. But I I just love that there's this approach in all things of being intentional with your kids, of taking their God-given personalities into account, into consideration, but also with the goal being not to follow culture, but instead to glorify God. Right. Yes. Love that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you so much for your silicone dishware. I just have to stop and... Thank you for that because now I have to get more of it. (laughs) I have a whole drawer of the Amazon variety and my toddlers will not touch them anymore. As soon as we got the yours, they were like, I will literally set out the bowls and they're like, not that one. No. And they'll come get yours. And if they're not in, if they're not in the bowl, in the drawer, they know to go to the dishwasher and look. And I'm like, all right, thanks. Yeah, baby goods. I now need to go get more of this because we're obsessed. So, and that's, that's the honest to goodness truth. Britt and Katie, it was such a pleasure to have you on. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and thank you for joining me. Thank Thank you so much, much, Abby. This is a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed the MS for Mama podcast, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and follow along, maybe share with friends or even leave a review. And if you want more content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, be sure to follow along on Instagram at m.is.for.mama.